Welcome to a morning talk show. Today, uh, I was fortunate to be uh, able to speak with Padre Gotuma. Padre Gotuma is a fascinating individual. Um, I really enjoy his presence in in uh, lectures and writing and poetry that he's done. Um, he's he's a, a poet who has a, a really great, very short podcast. Um, and I'll have links to that uh, in the description of the YouTube video, but it's through the On Being, uh, and it's called Poetry Unbound. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's an encouraging and inspiring thing. And so we talked about poetry, we talked about social media and prayer. Padre is, among other things, a theologian, uh, and he's, he's an activist, and he deals in conflict resolution. Um, so just, just an important figure and an important voice uh, in this day and time. So I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Um, and please like and subscribe for more of this kind of content. Hit the bell so you'll be notified. And thanks again. Padraig Otuma, welcome to Morning Talk Show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Aaron. And is it Aaron or Aaron? You know, in, in North America, we don't pronounce them differently. Um, Brit- oh. British people would say Aaron, uh, like, uh, like would make the A. Um, what about Irish people? More noticeable and Irish people. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't spo- I haven't had many Irish people say my name, so that's. <laughs> um, we tend to say Aaron here, but. Yeah, I noticed that the the first time I heard it, there was a I knew a British person, and she would say my name and kind of uh, implied that we were all, including myself, mispronouncing my name. So that's. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> you know how to say it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, welcome. I- I've been uh, very excited to to speak with you. And um, usually I begin by just telling someone uh, what it was that uh, really called out to me that that uh, made a conversation so um, desirable. And um, for yourself, um, it's uh, just the fact that in, in recent years, um, in my sort of searchings and st- you know random stabs in the dark to try and unpack uh, <laughs> a lot of things about um, faith and and philosophy and and love and care and things, uh, poetry keeps coming up um, in the people that uh, that I've poetry keep, keeps being mentioned by the people that are resonating with me the most, um, even though poetry is not something that I have ever uh in, in the past specifically sought um and uh and you are a poet and and not only a poet but a poet that is is known and and is in seemingly um just reaching a lot of people through your poetry so um i got into that and and um i guess um i'm just wondering uh first question i suppose what is what was your introduction to poetry or has it always been kind of something for you it's always been something for me Aaron. um the irish school curriculum starts off by learning two poems a week at the age of five one in english and one in irish and it doesn't stop so um um yeah it's it's very much part of the curriculum here um lots of irish poets were also political figures and so poetry and history are are interla- interlinked um yeah, and w- certainly when I was going sc- through school, we didn't um, have um, exams where for poetry exams where they'd give you um, the text of the poem in front of you. So I suppose you had to know seventy or eighty poems in each language for wow. at the for your major exams in order to be able to recall them, quote them, and then comment on them. Wow, um, yeah, that that's actually that's amazing. What mm. 
Like, did you find that might have changed now? I mean, I don't have children, so I don't know. Right. Um, I don't. I don't okay. know. But uh, yeah, uh, but so, poetry still is a very important part of the curriculum. I'm just not sure about the learning off by heart part, but I, yeah, certainly that benefited me hugely. So, um, and I always loved it. Um, I love the cadence of it. And we weren't just learning off cute poems for kids. I mean, at the age of um, 11, we learned off E Hanulag Naman by Sean O'Rear Down. And that's a poem really about a midlife crisis and a man facing um, his fear of death. Um, I reread it a few years ago. and I was like, my God, I could recite this whole damn thing by heart at the age of 11. And presumably, you know, we were told this bit here is about him being frightened of death and you, you learn that off with right. absolutely no comprehension. Now, you know, <laughs> pandemic yeah. year, I've had a lot of friends die. Um, I am now kind of going, yeah, I understand that now. But it's fascinating to know that there was a time when I could have recited that off by heart. And there are certainly poems that I th- that are um, easily recallable for me. Wow, that, that that's so interesting. It, so they're like, I guess with the with all of the mnemonic devices kind of embedded in uh, poetry, those things maybe become like a time release, uh, like for when you're ready for the concept. I think that's... Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. I mean, certainly poetry is its own kind of music and music comes back to you at different periods of your life. So, yeah. For sure. I, I've had, um, I remember we read Flannery O'Connor mm. in high school, I think, and... Uh, just zoom right over my head and i keep meaning to go back and read a good man is hard to find oh yeah she's um, amazing because i feel like it, it's the 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 ending line about she'd have been a good woman if there'd been someone there to kill her every minute of her life or something like that hmm. uh it, it's it's stuck with me it's it just like and i completely wasn't ready for yeah. it at the time so that's yeah. interesting education is wasted on the young <laughs> But but also, I mean, I think that uh, w- it sounds to me like they were really not uh, talking down to you in that particular way, like that they were, uh, you know, children were learning. I mean, you, you never know if the intention is actually yeah. as pure as it may, you know, as the effect may be. But it could have uh, been pure laziness. <laughs> I yeah, mean, it could have just been here, shut up and learn it. You know, exactly. I don't know what the intention was, um, but certainly we weren't. We weren't learning children's poetry. Uh, and I think presumably that has changed. I, I hope not entirely, because there is something very interesting about learning poems written by adults for adults when you're a child. But there's also something very entertaining and very engaging yeah. about um, poems that speak to the the younger experience. Yeah, so I, I've never known myself to not love poetry. Mm. Um, yeah, and he, like... Uh, poetry is in, entirely throughout my entire life. I used to look forward in the summer when we get the school books for the next year, looking through the poems that we'd be learning off by heart. And I have two older siblings and three younger siblings. So I would have heard from my older siblings which poems they liked during the years when they were in the classes that I was about to enter into and um, would always look forward to and sometimes pre-learn off by heart some of the poems. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's that's You were probably in the minority on that. I don't know. I never spoke about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just sort of a private thing. Um, yeah. One of the things I, I, I liked, or you said the word cadence, that you like the cadences of it. And that's something that I've been kind of um, wondering about. And it's extremely mysterious, but there's, uh, I've been kind of, um, uh, my, my sort of furthest intuition, like right at the sort of veil of, you know, what I can express has been that, that the cadences of language embed something, some information. And I guess I don't mean information like data, but Hmm. some, some, I don't know what you'd say, soul information um, that is, is possibly undervalued. I mean, uh, like, uh, cause I don't really hear people speaking about it, but my, um, my experience and one of the main reasons that I started a podcast was that I was listening to podcasts and I I was working and I realized that I would, if it was a good conversation, I would not be listening anymore at a, at a certain point I'd be on, onto my work, but I wouldn't want to turn it off. Hmm. And, um, it, it struck me that that was the first indication I had that there was something kind of, um, 
magical or sacred all these words are are a little bit uh loaded but like that there was something unusual about reciprocal conversation that was feeding me something that was doing mm -hmm. something for me and it was uh it's such a subtle thing that it's hard to uh to express is that something that you have found does that concept resonate with you um, I've noticed it this year, the last year during the pandemic, how much if there is a conversation that does feel, as you were saying, reciprocal and um, mirrors the kind of way that people talk to each other in a, a lovely and depth, um, but also still casual conversation, then that is a lovely balm to be reminded of, oh, this is what's possible when people meet up with friends um, or just end up in an interesting conversation with somebody, um, you know, yeah. So that is uh, it's the, the last year that's taken on a particular resonance for me. Um, I, I, I'm not surprised that that would be a part of your life because um, in, in listening to audio of you speak, um, I don't know if it's conscious or subconscious, but I feel that uh, you have a, a, um, a cadence and you bring a certain um, calm quality to your speech um that is uh i mean it definitely does something for me when you speak and, and i and i wonder is that something that you've consciously cultivated or is it just no, kind it's of a just my voice okay <laughs> <laughs> i wonder yeah. if yeah i mean i think your style of speaking is very informed by by poetry as well like even just your yeah. Your, your normal speech. Like, I, I, I wonder if it would just be valuable for everyone to recite poetry. Mm. Well, one of the interesting things about reciting poetry, um, it echoes in a certain sense about music, is that you have to, um, you have to, you have to pay attention to where you're going to take a breath, because typically you're aware of maybe um, you, you might be able to take a breath at the end of a line or where there's a full stop. Um, or where there's some kind of place that would imply a natural pause. And you have to think about that in a more conscious level than you would in ordinary speech, perhaps. But even in ordinary speech, I think we speak in, um, in little containers and take breaths in between or take breaths for emphasis or take breaths to let a moment pause or to build something up in anticipation. Um, so all of these verbal arts, like singing, like the recitation of poetry, like reading out loud, um, like any kind of oration, they all um, do something fundamental to the question of breath in our body. And mm. that is always going to be spiritual in the most true sense, spirit coming from the word spirare, meaning breath. And so um, to mm. breathe is to be spiritual. Uh, that has got nothing to do with whether a per person believes in a religious framework or anything right. else, but to be spiritual is to be breathing. Oh. And so um, I, I think that there is always going to be something of of the essence of ourselves that um, any attention to the breath is going to bring about. So hence yoga, hence meditation, hence prayer exercises, hence singing, um, all of these things do yeah. something to that, that isn't simply about the matter of, oh, you're making a noise and somebody else is listening. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess it's a big part of sex too. Uh, yes, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, so that, I mean, it's all, it's all, it's all spiritual stuff. And yeah. I've, heard, I've heard it said that uh, the, the word Yahweh is, is specifically a breathing word yeah i've read that too yeah that's interesting i mean i'm not i i think it's a lovely hypothesis about it um yeah. i don't think it's the only way to understand yeah well, of course not yeah it's just one of those things if it if it if it twigs in your mind and means something yeah. it means something yeah yeah but certainly i mean i know some people who would use it as a as a meditation mm -hmm. um, yeah for sure um so i what what it sounds kind of like what you're saying it, it it sort of breaks down the um it breaks down the distinction between prayer and speech you know or prayer yeah. and poetry or prayer and music i mean that's a pretty simple idea that i think a lot of people have but um yeah mm. like do you do you sort of do you see your 
poetry as prayer? Um, I mean, I, I don't distinguish too, too um, particularly in the border between those things, but I also wouldn't think that all prayer is poetry or all poetry is prayer. Right. Um, yeah. I'm doing a PhD at the moment, part time. And um, one of the thing, one of the documents that I'm researching for the PhD, it's in poetry, um, and particularly looking at poetry and prayer. Um, mm. One of the documents I'm looking at is uh, this book, uh, Dawn Today. It's a book published in 1928 oh, um, of poems. Oh, sorry, of well, Dawn Today means um, the poems of God, um, and it is. Um, it's uh, hymns from all across Ireland in the Irish language tradition oh, um, right. that the woman, Unani Hogan, who really was something like an ethno-choreologist um, or ethno-musicologist, um, she collected these texts and then wrote, the, wrote, the, wrote some footnotes about them all, gorgeous old Irish. Um, mm. And then, God help her, she died the year before the book was published. She died in oh, no. 1927. Um, and um, the, the, they're all hymns from different valleys all across Irish-speaking Ireland. And um, she calls them the poems of God. And so hymns, poetry, music, prayer, um, you, they can, in certain circumstances, be all gathered under the same one word, dawn, in Irish, which is the word we use for poetry. But that word itself, dawn, comes from a word meaning destiny. And so... I suppose that all of that implies that these verbal arts, whether that's of writing a lyric for a poem or a prayer or a hymn, um, they are looking to a certain kind of horizon, whatever that horizon might be. It might be an apocalyptic one, it might be about revealing the present or about telling mm. the past or about meditating on a particular scene or about some kind of hope embedded. That isn't everything that poetry can be, but um, certainly it's some of the things that poetry can be. Um, not every poem is asking for something. The word prayer, prier from French means to ask. Mm. Um, not every poem is asking for something, but on perhaps a deeper level, it is asking to be listened to or read or to be understood or to be felt. So, um, and I, I mean, I think I, I, the, the question of God for me is a, is a, is a big question. Um, but in the midst of that being a big question, I still think that prayer has great value because it is a slowing and a focusing of the mind and an imagining of a you to whom you can speak, mm. um, whether or not you believe in that you. It's still functional to to carve your intention, to carve your desire into something that's focused toward even an imagined you. I think that can have um, uh that can have artistic value and imaginative value and personal value too when it comes to thinking about what it means to live your life. That, that's, uh, that's really interesting and it resonates with me quite strongly. It resonates with my experience because, um, you know, even as I asked you if poetry was prayer, there's something that feels kind of course about that you know like uh, there's something that feels sort of and even the even the idea I'm fascinated by doing a PhD on this on the topic right because I'm sure that what you're not doing is is pinning down the definition uh, oh god of yeah when, no. of when something is a prayer and when something is yeah. not a prayer <laughs> and 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 just sort of you're not taking the subjective reality out of oh, it no. No, it's a creative PhD, so I'm right. Mostly, I'm writing poetry, and then right. writing some commentary on that. Um, but yeah, even if it wasn't, a, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't do an analytical PhD. But e even if I were to, that would I would not be interested in looking at the the border point or the gate through which a piece of text passes, where on one side it's a prayer and the other side it's a poem. Yeah, um, no, that's... that wouldn't it wouldn't interest me. And I, I I would also think that it's who is to say. Yeah. It's very much my background, uh, and, and like from the from the my life in the past, and uh, obviously still in many ways because you don't you fundamentally change when you change a few ideas, but uh, it it is so. It, it is something that I have experienced rather than uh, something intellectual, 
that exact thing that you're talking about where you pray and it, and I was trying to tell this to a friend the other day because it was so like, I, I almost find it funny and ridiculous. Uh, but you pray as though you're praying to someone, you, you don't know what it is, but just like it's not, um, just like it's not only not important to decide where poetry becomes prayer or to, to, to draw a line. I mean, it feels like that same concept can be expanded to God, to actually God, to say that it's, it's actually damaging to define God, like to, to make like a final definition of God or to say, you know what I mean? Like, and, and so it, it's been something, it's so hard to tell people that, hey, why don't you try this? Because it, but it's been so, so interesting to me to, to begin, yeah, speaking prayers and, and, and even just thinking thoughts of God and, and just putting aside the requirement that there be understanding. You know, you're shooting an arrow um, yeah. and you're not, you're shooting an arrow and you didn't go and place the target yourself, you know, and, and the target is beyond, the target is beyond the veil. And, and at first I thought I was getting, sorry, the veil. I always think of this cloud and then I always do this with my hands. I always think <laughs> of this cloud um, of, of beyond, at the edge of our understanding and that, um, that, and then if you go, if you're disillusioned long enough, the cloud is is a friend, you know, it, it, it's something that you don't really want to go away, but it's really difficult in the culture, the way it is. And, and it feels to me like that intuition of um, actually wanting mystery to remain a mystery is on the decline. Have you, have you experienced that or what, what's your relationship with, with the, the sort of mystery? I, I think you've already started to elucidate mm -hmm. that. Well, I think one of the things you're talking about here is the complexity of language when it comes to speaking about meaning and speaking within a religious context, context about the question of God. Um, I take great uh, nurture from the Jewish tradition. I learned to read the Bible really with Jewish friends and with reading Midrash and reading um, commentators on Hebrew Bible. And um, Aviva Zornberg, who is an extraordinary writer, um, with many books um, written in her book, uh, The Murmuring Deep, which is a, an, a psychoanalytic reading of certain um, narrative pieces of Hebrew Bible, plenty of which are from Genesis, but not all. Um, she speaks about the, the recognition of the Bible as literature within which God is character, within which God is understood to be narrator, and also beyond which God is understood to be beyond language. And for her, she's, she highlights that each iteration of God that we can comprehend <laughs> um, is always calling us to the edges of it. And so God is character, you know, wandering around the Garden of Eden or saying, you know, have this um, sacrifice done to me tomorrow by sunset. You know, that's that's God written into a text as character. And the whole point is to see that as a function, if you believe in God, is to see that a fun as a function of God rather than the entirety of God. Because if God, if that's the entirety of God, we're screwed. OK, <laughs> and so she says that God is um character and narrator and then something bigger too that's utterly beyond language and i suppose um for lots of people for different reasons um some of which are artistic some of which are ethical um and some of which are intellectual and other things um the way within which people conflate the idea of there being a prime mover a creator of of all that is and conflate that with a character who is speaking <laughs> about what to do tomorrow before lunchtime, you know, uh, yeah. that um, that is insulting and also dangerous because of the implication that God chose a people and didn't choose others. Right. Um, that that God was saying who to kill, who not, and what mm. wars to carry on, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, and so what I see is that she's highlighting that the text point beyond, points beyond the text, that the text is nonetheless saying, here's a way in a certain sense to rid yourself of the idea of God that's worked up until now. And here's a way always to be moving yourself to a greater expansion of an understanding, mm. um, which is at the same time a journey out as well as a journey in. 
And I really like that. I think that is wise. And I am fairly uninterested in any final definition of the word God. Um, what, what interests me is the language we use while we speak about that. And even more than the language, what the impact of it is. I mean, if my language about God is really to figure out who I can justify hating, then I'm uninterested in the question of language. And I need to face my question of why do I desire to hate and what is the function of hate in my life? If right. my curiosity about the language of God is something that is trying to consider um, the way it means to be human and what does it mean to be ethical, well, then perhaps that pursuit of that language itself is yielding something of the fruitfulness that you think religion might bring about. Yeah, I guess if you pursue love from any angle and you and and you're careful not to uh define it uh too harshly again like god like i keep coming back to definitions because um i i've been having an ongoing long talk with a, a a materialist atheist friend who um uh he he's, he's just curious why someone would believe and, and I'm the wrong guy to talk to about it because I don't know, I, I don't know what I believe, but it, but it, he's so open and nice to talk to that uh, I keep going on and on. And it, it, it ends up being this thing where um, I feel like I'm trying to make someone fall in love with my wife, <laughs> you know, like, uh, or, and it's, a, it's, it's so futile, like, you know, they either, they either love or don't, but like uh, what keeps coming up is these, um, uh, definition is definition. So I will say something and I'll say faith and they'll say, well, but you're, you know, the frustrating thing is you're fudging with the definition of what faith is. You're telling me that I have faith, but you're, you're not using the definition of faith. And I guess what you're, or you're not using the definition of faith that I have of faith. And, and so it's what, what kind of uh, like this, this thing that's sort of taken shape in my mind throughout this conversation is that, um, that's that's maybe one of the hallmarks of of the type of spirituality that has had any helpful impact on my life is that it's it's specifically um, it's specifically resisting um, uh, eternal definitions of 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 concepts even which is very sketchy it's very sketchy territory and, and so I I would like I I I would form I form my definition of what faith is because I want that word to have a meaning to me and I want that word to be uh, a, a part of my life. Um, and I feel like the, the light is shining from behind the word, you know, the word is, the word is kind of in relief against <laughs> this light from behind. And, and I'm looking for that light that's behind the word, but uh, it's also, um, it's it's yeah well like like I say it's it's very sketchy but uh, but the the other side of it is that when um, that a, a harshly defined like so to put God aside and think of other transcendent ideas such as justice or or um, or love or or care or kindness and and you kind of realize that you look at the dictionary definition of them and you're not that's not what you're living that that's not the reality of justice in your life is whatever it says in Webster's you know if you look up faith or look up love and then you compare it to your attempts to not anger your loved ones you know your attempts to serve them a little bit you know in some way that that they feel um, and it's not, it has nothing to do with the dictionary definition or sorry not nothing but you know it's it's quite expanded and and so there's a there, there seems to just almost be a, a tyranny that develops specifically through the concept of full understanding, like uh, like our answers are are kind of these um, our answers are kind of these little babies, you know that that we've invited into our lives. Like, I've answered this question. Good for me, uh, you know. And then you put this. You have. I, I feel like you have this this answer, and it's 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 not about hating the answer or um, rejecting the answer or saying you're wrong. It's about loving the answer as the question changes. And when the question changes, then the answer kind of naturally changes and you have to be able to release your answers. Now I'm just ranting, uh, but <laughs> does, the, does, that, <laughs> does that resonate with you or do you have any thoughts? 
Well, I mean, when it comes to big questions like, you know, what is love? What is justice? Um, what is God? Um, different people are going to answer that differently. Some will want to answer it through action. Some will want to answer it through definition. Others answer it through poetry. Mm. Others answer it through other forms of art. Others answer it through protest. Um, mm. and so, and all of those, I think, are going to be necessary languages in terms of responding to the question. Um, the idea that one pursuit will be the thing that lands on the definitive um definition <laughs> definitive definition that's kind of anyway uh, i i think the idea that one pursuit will be the thing that that lands us into the final way of speaking of it is is limited um because the whole point i think is that um different folks are going to perceive um different doorways into answering that question mm-hmm. and the intellectual pursuit and the uh, defining pursuit of that in language is only one of those and even within the idea of defining it in language you'd get some people who'd want a dictionary definition other people will want a poem other people will want a you understand a story other people will want psychoanalysis all of those themselves are are syntactically based they're all language based answers but each 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 using language in a different way as well so yeah Here's a poem. We've been speaking about poetry, so um, here's a poem called In the Image of God. Yes. In the image of God, the text tells a God. And God tells God, telling God, telling God. And with each telling, the image comes closer and rhymes a little more with the sounds from the mouths of our own hungry bodies. And God wrote, God writing God, writing God. So we say no because we know that someone somewhere said no too. And the echo of a man, the text tells a voice and the voice tells a story. So the story sounds like God. Mm. For me, this is a kind of a warning against sectarianism and sectarianism isn't just an Irish um, practice, although we're good at it here. Mm -hmm. Um, The way within which the borders between my group, whatever that group is, and our, our our pained relationship with your group, whatever that group is, especially if they're slightly neighboring um, and similar enough to find their differences abhorrent. Um, the the practice of that is something that we find in, in so many populations of people around the world. Mm. And the, the, um, the idolizing of my group's behavior um, the idolizing of that into a language that speaks of God as the ultimate prime mover and the creator of things. And therefore our group responds to, to that being the better one than theirs. Um, I think that is recipe for war. Um, mind you, p- communities without the question of God also have found their own recipes into war. So <laughs> God isn't, a, it's too easy to think that the only reason to, the only, the only blaming for war goes on the question of religion, but yeah, um, yeah, but nonetheless, as somebody who has been influenced by religion and continues to be, um, I I think the question about how we use the language about God to speak about the language of human community, and especially then about those we might see to be either outside or not inside the borders that we define um, of belonging, that's always going to be a question that will interest me. And certainly I think the circumstances of my life and the period of time that I've been born into has meant that that's shaped me. The question of what's on the border, what's on the other side of the border, who polices the border, is the border open, is the border armed or fortified? Um, should the border be eradicated? Should the border be opened, et cetera? Mm-hmm. Um, those things have really interest to me when it comes to the question of what belief is, what religion is, what God is. Yeah. yeah. So, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I guess if it, it's if you're not uh, if if you're someone looking to to break down borders uh, uh, and and to uh, to question borders at the very least, then you're you're kind of always in motion. You're always you're always moving. Mm. Uh, so uh, you you have been somebody who hasn't shied away from the use of social media. Mm. Uh, in in your public online presence and that's that's another of the fundamental reasons that i wanted to talk to you because 
in your presentation, uh, you know, the way that you present yourself and the style of your poetry, I, I would, I would almost assume that you would be someone who would not embrace social media, you know, because it is, um, there's, there's so much press about how toxic it is. And there's this new, um, movie, uh, the social, um, dilemma okay. all about that good, good movie, but our good documentary, but it, it has that been kind of just natural or has it been something that you've done as, as a discipline or as an experiment? You know, I joined Twitter so that I'd be able to text a friend via DM um, or private message um, in the States. And this was before there were other apps where you could text each other for free or online, you know. Oh, okay. Um, she had moved away from Ireland. And so regularly enough, if there was a, a comment or something funny on the radio when she'd live here, I, we'd be texting each other back and forth. And then she moved to the United States. And I was thinking, how can I keep in touch without <laughs> amping up a telephone bill? Um, so that's why I joined Twitter years ago um, to be able to keep in touch with her and we're still in touch. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, all social media does is reveal us to ourselves. Uh, each revealing is a new reveal is a is an old revealing, perhaps with some new speed. I think one of the things about social media is an increased capacity for speed, and that is something new and speed and audience. But um, people have been dealing in spin and manipulation for a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. People have been um, being accusatory. History has been um, fought over and the victors have been seeking to put their headline on the question about what the aggression behind a war was or who the the true villain was or etc for a very very long time and some of the worst parts of social media are just things that have been around since before amplified it seems to us now um but i'm sure in popular in, in times gone by people thought that their ways of slander um were also amplifying um, or their echo chambers were also echo chambers and that those were crises. Right. Um, so so I, I suppose I think that to blame social media for stuff is to is to lose the point that people have been doing the kind of things we see, see on social media, albeit amplified with a larger audience and a, and a, a, a quicker access to speed. Um, yeah. And then the, the manipulative power of social media in terms of selling stuff or pitting people against each other, which I know is at the heart of much social media. I get annoyed at times with social media because you put up a funny photograph of yourself when you were younger and, you know, you get loads of likes and then you put up something to do with, there's a really important cause that I'd think folks should kind of follow along. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, you don't get too many people interested. Partly, maybe people are already interested in lots of things and they're already supporting um, other things. So maybe they turn to social media for a bit of distraction. So it can be all kinds of things. Um, yeah, so I, I, I like it. I don't take it too seriously, um, but I, I like it. I follow along people who I admire. Um, I, I dislike the idea that the question as to what a person's reach is is measurable only in the question about an analysis of their social media. When it certainly in the book world, what I think the interest of the book world is, is how little can we get away with spending on our marketing budget? So if you've got more people that follow you, well, therefore you're doing some of the marketing for us. And partly I can understand presses that have got a small marketing budget and are trying to figure that out. Um, yeah. That's natural, I think. I don't think it's good, but uh, I, I also don't think it's, you know, spawn of the devil to, th right. to think about it like that. But I think that important ideas don't always come from, or in, in fact, regularly and perhaps often don't come with people who are that interested in social media. And um, the idea that only the important ideas of people who have what, what could be considered reach, um, mm. it, I think that's a dangerous way of imagining it. I, I suppose I would put a, a burden of thinking that social media is only one way um, to consider mm -hmm. ways of getting a message out, whether that's about a cause or a piece of art, piece of writing, some music, etc. So, yeah. yeah, I like it, um, uh, uh, but I don't take it too seriously. That's good. I, I'm, I'm in a similar boat. I guess when Donald Trump 
got elected and we all kind of looked around and realized that social media had had a hand in people not knowing that it, it was possible for him to get elected, like really thinking to the bitter end that it wasn't possible that he was going to become the president of the United States. And, mm -hmm. and that was the that was when I sort of really said, OK, I have to think about whether I want to be on on Facebook and on, on social media and what I'm going to if I'm going to stay, it's got to be something that is redemptive in some way. And so um, I, I sort of set about doing that um, for my own social media. And I know that you've been uh, using social media to, you know, there's your to, to promote poetry and 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 um, and it, in person events, which I guess are now kind of uh, not not a thing. But uh, I, I would love to see there be a way to have. Um, well, I mean, there is a way you can have conversations uh, like, you know, just real conversations with people now, not necessarily right on social media. I guess there's Facebook uh, video chat. But uh, I wonder if the if the COVID pandemic is going to uh, have a redemptive effect on sim at, at least face to face conversations, because everybody has had to kind of begrudgingly jump on to Zoom and, and Skype and all these things that they've been avoiding and, and have sort of sort of as much of a face to face conversation as they can have. Um, I mean, I'm sure when when the telephone was invented that some people thought, oh, God, that's going to wreck our village. Um, and, you know, when kind of systematized postal systems were invented, were people thinking, oh, God, you know, just writing to each other isn't enough. You need to see each other face to face. Right. So each new form of communication is going to bring with it um, people who will be alert to the dangers of it and people who will be alert to the possibilities of it. And I think it's there's there's likely to be wisdom um, uh, from both of those points of view as well as from many other points of view as well. Um, so the question for me is how you're using these things. Mm. Uh, I mean, when you see, and without a doubt, there are extraordinary abuses. Um, yeah. overwhelming abuses um, and then I think also of there's an account I follow on Instagram called Friendless Churches which is a small charity set up across the water in Britain and it's just photographs of um, churches that aren't being used anymore that's oh, beautiful uh, that it's, sounds great it's stunning and it does something really stilling sometimes I go deliberately to look at I wonder what they've put up lately Think of other people who post stuff about art, and um, there's uh, there's all kinds of really interesting things. The question for me is what you're following, and also, I mean, especially on Twitter, where people's retweets are coming up, um, or what they've liked. Um, the question is, is what's your discernment? Um, uh, these old words like discernment and hermeneutics and interpretation, words that you use in literature. Uh, and law in politics and in theology and other disciplines too, um, those become really vital questions. Um, mm. How are we going to interpret this? Um, are you going to just take this fact for here? Are you going to pay attention to this rage that's been stoked in you? And mm. who might be benefiting from the rage that's just been stoked? What might you do? Might you buy something? Might you vote for someone? Mm. And, um, and who's benefiting from that mm. and at whose expense? And those for me are questions in the art of living that have always been necessary and they continue to be necessary in a digital age, but they were yeah. necessary way before the digital age too. And it's quite fascinating because I think uh, uh, you almost don't want, you don't want to approach it the same way you would approach. Uh, I, I totally love what you just said, by the way, I don't mean to just jump on mm -hmm. to something else, but uh, you, 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 you don't want to approach it exactly as you would in person, because if you had as much conflict in person, as people have on Facebook, it would be, it'd be ridiculous. You would, you would have to do what you indeed should do on, on social media, which is to develop a different approach to uh, a situation that could cause conflict to, to be like, just for yeah. myself, can I be, can I have this much conflict? Cause at a certain point in life, it, it, there, there might be a righteousness to the idea of confronting if someone spoke to you the way they might speak to you on, on Facebook, you know, there might be this thing of like, well, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't abide that, you know, I'm, I need to speak back. And, you know, you might have this one co confrontation and then go on with your life. But on Facebook, it's just like, it's sort of like 
with with uh, parenting young children, it's like, okay, at a certain point, how many ridiculous conflicts can I have uh, before I realize that I have to be the person to put myself aside and and either get off, go away or do something redemptive with it, try and go in a, in a, in a certain direction. And I kind of wonder if there isn't a, a type of insight and wisdom that is more available in in a conflict or an intense in a, in a tense situation than mm. when people are in a complacent mode. I, I don't know how to, I'm, it's a new thought, so I, I, I might be wrong there, but you're a person who has ha- dealt with a lot of conflict. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, being in, I, I, I don't, well, it's, it's very rare. I've ever gotten involved in a conflict on Facebook or a social media because right. I mean, I, I, I read people's differing opinions and I, I read some threads um, partly because on the one hand it evokes two human experiences one of which is a deep sense of powerlessness when you're reading something you think oh my god look at all this you know all these so Donald Trump put something out for instance and then you see all the people who laud it and all the people who loathe it and you know you can see this thing and on the other hand while it's on the one hand evoking powerlessness it's also evoking a fantasy of powerfulness Mm. I might be the one to say something that will change his mind. It's like playing the lottery. You know, it's the possibility of something that is um, its selling point. And um, I suppose paying attention to the to the draw of both of those and the fantasy of both of those things is um, of interest to me, how we would rather be drawn into the fantasy of total powerlessness or the fantasy of total powerfulness rather than think, I wonder what organizations are doing interesting advocacy work around this. How can I find them? <laughs> Do I right. give them, you know? Uh, yeah. And so I suppose every opportunity to see a conflict is is an opportunity to think, what do I think? Um, and if I were just sitting in a cafe and this argument was happening over there, would I walk over and go, I know, totally, <laughs> you know, yeah. would, I, would I do that? Um, and maybe you would, because there are times of investment like yeah. that. Or similarly, uh, you know, when groups of people are brought together to discuss uh, with anger and pain and upset um, and strong feeling the things that cause them to differ very seriously in public, um, there there's always the question about how valuable such encounters can be too. And even, I mean, and I've done a lot of that work in, as a conflict mediator, bringing groups of people together to talk about their differences. And it's group work in conflict mediation I'm particularly interested in right you're always dealing with so much there there's group belonging there's group threat there's um there's desperation there's timing there is disparity of power there's the impact of history there is a meritocracy as well as a uh, an imagined aristocracy as well as then profound um embedded uh discriminations that happen in all these contexts there's the question that whatever you're talking about is really important for some people in terms of the issue and for other people actually the issue they don't care about what they really care about is winning and there's for other people what they really really care about is definitely not reaching resolution because they fucking love to argue (laughs) and so you've got all of this happening at the same time and the question in a conflict mediation is to think what is my role in terms of offering people um, some way for some ways forward where if they wish they might be able to live in a way beyond this question that's dividing them or you know contribute together to some kind of fruitful outcome of the injustice um, mm. but ultimately in a in a conflict mediation if you realize you don't give a shit about this being resolved then you go well, I'm wasting my time then yeah this yeah. is not a mediatable conflict because mediation is seen as a threat by some people who are in a conflict because yeah. some folks love the luxury of being able to keep a conflict alive and dis- and especially will be resistant to recognizing that that conflict they're keeping alive is actually endangering or threatening the life or safety or well-being or futures of other populations of people whose um, privilege has been re- removed by the fantasy of this being just an intellectual conversation. So I suppose all of those things are revealed on social media, but <laughs> I've seen them all in rooms as well. Um, and so the question yeah. is, is, you know, what am I going to get involved with? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's really unfortunate and, and you do, it, it almost seems like, or it's, it's fortunate when it, when conflict can lead to sort of new insights for everybody, but I almost feel like, um, 
the the concept of resolution has been is in increasingly that people actually don't believe that it is possible and i think that's maybe the the most frightening thing about what's going on right now and that that's well like, yeah I, I think media. you need to i think you'd need to define what resolution means though because i i have sympathy with some people who have rejected certain notions of resolution because for some, the idea of resolution is let's just live and let live. It's fine. Both sides have said terrible things. Lovely. Let's just move on. And I, I find that abhorrent and intellectually um, unstimulating, but even more so, I find that dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. Resolution is something that isn't frightened of paying attention to the imbalance of power, to the serious question of paying attention to privilege, to the really important question of establishing um, equity, not just equality. And so um, it depends what, what version of resolution is being put forward. Um, yeah. And so I, I'm totally with certain groups of people who would say, um, I reject this notion of resolution. Um, and at the same time, I'm also, I'm not an idealist when it comes to questions to do with conflict. Um, there does unfortunately need to be the question of a certain amount of pragmatics and um, enough compromise that you are going to keep people in the room together to talk about something where hopefully you'll have a modicum of a possibility of human relationship mm. after um, resolution has been reached. So That's, that interests me. That kind of resolution interests me. Yeah. But, but not not fake ones that are defined by people who lose nothing and gain everything by it. Right. And that's that's fair enough. You're, you're wonderfully nuanced on this, which makes sense as someone who has dealt with so much conflict mm -hmm. in, in doing conflict, doing intentional conflict resolution. So I love that. And yeah, so that is true. Defining what resolution would look like. I think that it, you know, we, we often have such a default idea of, of what it looks like. And then resolution, be, the resolution becomes whatever the default idea was of the, of the person who had the power to begin with. <laughs> totally. And they also might be petrified of conflict. Lots yeah. of conflict resolution isn't conflict resolution. It's, it's fear of conflict or conflict yeah. about conflict. And people yeah. just going, stop fighting, stop fighting, stop fighting, you know, do anything to stop fighting. I understand yeah. that. I don't like conflict. Um, but I, th I think, we have plenty of it, and certainly social media amplifies a certain version of it, including the most diabolical kinds where people are calling for death penalties. And very quickly, if somebody disagrees with a woman about something that she said online, all you have to do is to read down the comments. Before, and it's I'd say usually within three or four comments before somebody has made an attack on her personhood. And that is a way within which you see um, certain proportions of the male population are always itching I think, to have an excuse to justify saying something violent uh, about or to or against the personhood of a woman. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, it's so true. Um, I, I am a person who has spent, um, you know, my life avoiding conflict and it's my person, it's in my personality. I was the good kid at home and, mm. uh, and you realize when you become in your 30s and, uh, and I'm 40 now and, and it's like oh wow there's actually just a lot of conflict in my life that's still uh that there was rejected conflict but it, it's still there you know the, the the ghosts of it are still there and I've been blessed in, in a way with a a son who um has no qualms about conflict uh <laughs> like about fighting the fight uh for what he uh wants or thinks and uh, it's been the most painful thing uh, that's happened to me in my entire life because I love him wow. more than, you know, I can say. And mm -hmm. uh, but I, I have to I have to keep reminding myself that uh, that it, it, he is he is an expression of another kind of another way to be. And I find mm -hmm. myself in a situation where I'm pleading, saying, we don't have to have a conflict about this. Look, like I've given I've given us a an out to the conflict they've given us a way out so uh, you know that's a freebie for you, you we don't have to fight like because because when <laughs> i was a kid i couldn't imagine anything worse than fighting with my father it was just, it was just not going to happen i would go into my room i would i with both fists i would flail at my bed uh and let it let it all out uh rather than have conflict with the man who had um, you know the paddle. Um, and, I mean, that's a that's that's not necessarily avoiding 
that that could be a very reasonable response to conflict. It wasn't, you know, you could have done worse things with it. Right. You know, it, it's, you I, I'm not, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not necessarily trying to say that it was always the wrong thing to do. I'm just like, I'm just, you know, thinking that, that there, there's another way to be. And it's something that um, there, there is, there is righteous conflict might not be the right word, but there is righteous resistance to, um, to power. And I think it's like maybe one mm -hmm. of the most difficult things to, um, to live out in a, in a proper way. I mean, you, you see that you, 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 the story of Don Quixote is, is comes to mind as, uh, you know, this person who, um, had this kind of system of righteousness and, and of opposing, uh, opposing evil and is kind of a hilarious figure in a way. And, and then there's also the, the idea that um, so much of the time, what's really needed is care and, and kind of a relinquishing of power by someone. And so it's difficult to know how to oppose such massive forces in the world, like what you're describing. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, how, how old is your son, Aaron? He's eight. Eight. What does he? I mean, you may not want to talk about this, oh. um, because of his privacy, also. But um, when the two of you talk about different relationships to conflict, you clearly, um, for you, it feels fruitful and good to think. Well, let's find a way out. That's a win-win. Yeah. What does he? How does he understand what's happening there? Does he see um, that as a loss? Well, when we're not in conflict, um, mm. he seems to understand. Um, yeah, it, but uh, it's just, uh, I don't really know how to answer that question exactly. I mean, uh, I'd like to say that he fully understands, you know, the situation. But I, I don't, I don't think he does, but I also don't, I would also like to find better ways of, of um, you know, better ways of letting him know that, that his resistance to me, like something where I can say, um, it's okay. I mean, I do say it's okay to be angry and, and you're, you know, um, just to, just, I, I'm, I'm, I feel sometimes ill-equipped to give him, uh, tools to resist me properly. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> like that's why, why, what, or, or why do I, why do you feel ill-equipped? I feel ill-equipped because I just have no, um, I don't know. I'm just, I have such a, I have such a low value on conflict. Mm -hmm. I have such a, you know, I, I have a, I have a bipolar relationship to conflict where I'm either completely trying to avoid it or, or snap into absolute victor totalitarian mode, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, there's, there's very little kind of you know, I have to, I'm holding myself back from just going, fuck you, you know, just not to him, but to, yeah. <laughs> to people who, with whom I have adult conflict. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not sure that's, a, that's a good, um, I mean, good question. there's a, there's an old and slightly dated model of looking at conflict as if it's an X, Y axis. No, I'm terrible at mathematics, but remember the X, Y axis in mathematics, where the x-axis is the bottom one and the y one is the, the vertical one. Mm -hmm. um, and in this model called the Thomas Kilman conflict, mo conflict mode indicator, as well as some other ones, the axis on the bottom is, um, is cooperation. Um, and the axis, the y-axis, the vertical one, is assertion. And the question is, is where are you going to be in there? Are you going to be low cooperation, low assertion, that would be considered avoidance. And there's really good reasons to be avoidant. Sometimes you go, I don't give a damn. Like, that's a really good thing. Yeah. Um, what you were talking about is your your opposite, is to just go right up the assertion scale. It's still really low in cooperation, but it's just with a lot more um, dominance. That's also good. If you're saying, get the hell out, there's a fire, it's good to be like that. Or other situations where you know there's a justice issue here that unless I have my way, actually something, you know, I, I feel tasked with a mandate. But then there's all these other interesting options too that do go up and down the question of assertion, but also move up and down the question of cooperation in terms of accommodation. Sometimes you might go, well, you have your way. I'm happy to go along. 
or a bit of both, you know, some piece of compromise or the really time demanding one that you should only be used if there's a really good win-win is collaboration. Where I work with you and you work with me and we talk about it. It requires trust, but the outcome is so much better. Mm. And all of those things, all of those modes are are really, really good for us to be developing fluency. And lots of people, I think, have a, a natural one they go to. That might be avoidance. That might be um, what would be called competition. The, the, uh, that might be accommodating. The question is, is if you go there so often that actually you begin to experience the negative effects of it and other people begin to either take advantage of it or become, begin to get frightened of it, well, then that's a dangerous societal way to be. Mm. Um, if, if I'm working with somebody whose only mode is that they win, well, then I'm I'm probably unlikely to want to work with them right. because yeah. that's, you know, uh, even when they're right, <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing is even and especially when they're right. Mm. Um, so I don't know, part of me thinks that some some learning about conflict and like you described two very particular ones in terms of, you know, you're either avoiding or you're kind of in control. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting of, to me to look at the question for you in terms of what um, accommodating might look like and moving up and down that and yeah, yeah or that, cooperation. That is, uh, that is very interesting. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not asserting, I'm not proud of the, <laughs> the bipolar nature of the way that I respond sometimes, but I feel yeah. like I'm, I'm, I'm holding myself back and holding myself back and then, and then exploding. I mean, that's not, that's not the, the, the norm, the day-to-day -day no. norm. And the other, the other element, oh, sorry, you look like you were going to say something. Well, yeah. I mean, just in the sense of what's interesting to me is that you, you clearly do have moments of assertion. And I, I wouldn't call that bipolar because bipolar is something totally different. I think what you're saying is that you recognize two strong modes. Um, uh, but it's curious to me to go, well, what's the benefit of both of those at different times? And then what's the drawback and what are some other options that you could look at rather than judging? It sounds like on the one hand you see, um, you know, avoidance as a kind of a thing of not as, you know, something that you might feel a bit shamed of because maybe you don't think, yeah. you, maybe you think you should be a bit more. And then you see high assertion as something that maybe yeah. you do feel ashamed of because you feel like high assertion kind of has is synonymous with aggression. Right. Um, and even calling it bipolar, which again is something different. You know, there's even a kind of a, a, a an imagination there that that's something that has to be treated. Um but I don't know. All you're telling me is that you know, you move up and down the scale of assertion. Yeah. Um. That's that's a good thing to do. The question yeah. is, is to diminish your conflict about that experience and also give yourself some other options to think about, right. which is the right way to be. I suppose. I suppose what this highlights, because I haven't uh, talked about it in exactly this way. I suppose what it highlights is actually that I feel a certain amount of shame in both states, yeah, uh, okay. which is. Which is not great, you know, because because yeah, neither one. Is... <laughs> no, you're ashamed about shamed. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm really not. I'm I'm glad to I'm glad to clarify this, and I thank you yeah. for this for this way of thinking. And I did, and I should not. You're right. I should not use the term bipolar. I was actually thinking of two poles, uh, yeah. not not bipolar disorder. I was just thinking yeah. about how little middle Polar ground opposite. there was. Yeah, yeah like yeah. De, like a, a a a binary. I guess you could. Yeah, say. that's okay, a little. Yeah. That's more of a. That doesn't describe a. Uh, mental health, a, a legitimate yeah. mental health condition. But yeah, the I mean, the other thing with uh, and and this is stimulating a lot of a, a lot of thoughts. So I really appreciate it. The other thing that came to mind is I was going to say, um, uh, with a with a child, there's there's often um, the actual conflict is not what is really um, raging inside them. It was just an outlet, and so sometimes like the measured conversation after the fact can't really happen uh uh it, until until he knows why why he was really upset which is much much harder to to express but then the obvious follow on to that is that that's adults too you know it's it it, it may it, and that's one of the blessings of having a child because i find that some of these things in him they're kind of exp exploded into a cartoonish proportion yeah. so that you can see it uh, like so that you can see it. And then if, if, if you can, you can apply it to yourself. Like, what am I really, you know, if I'm frustrated at, at, at work, am I really frustrated that I would like to be doing something different? Uh, you know, or, or am I actually frustrated about this project, you know, or, or is it a, obviously a mixture of both, which is usually the case, but yeah, yeah. it's, 
I, I see as plenty, not all children who um, for a long period of time in their life have an extraordinary capacity to ex- express um, fundamental rage in public, <laughs> you know, by tantrums or different things. Um, I find that distressing, um, but I, well, I don't always find it distressing. Sometimes I just think, yeah, I know. Look at the rage of the world. If I'm ever holding a yeah. niece or nephew, and I've got plenty of them, and they're bawling, you just I talk to them in Irish about you know the reasons to be angry with the world, um, trying to do it in a way where they might fall asleep, but also I hope paying attention to yeah, I know. Listen to all the things to be angry about, um, and then hopefully the question is is to to mature with age into a way where we are not denying the rage that we carry in us. Um, uh, but finding a way to use that energy in a way that's creative rather than destructive. Mm-hmm. And we all know in ourselves the moments when we've moved toward the creativity of that of that energy and moved toward the destruction of that energy. And mm-hmm. in, in everything you said, um, Aaron, about, you know, your relationship with anger um, and your relationship with conflict um, and avoidance, the thing that holds that and that feels fundamental to me is the way that you introduced your son to say you can't imagine loving anybody else more in the world than he, even though the two of you find yourself to be profoundly different when it comes to the question mm. of conflict, which I think is beautiful. And uh, what I hear in that is something that's enviable. Somebody who would speak about, you know, to be a child where their parent would speak about them. Um, with such profound love mm. and respect, I think that is a an enviable place for him to be. Well, you're you know? you're you're very kind. You're very skilled with this conflict, uh, conflict resolution stuff. Uh, I I really appreciate that part of the conversation. It wasn't really, wasn't really one of the intentions of of the talk. But I uh, I, I never want to put a limit on things. That's that's wonderful. So mm. I guess are you are are you uh, you've had a lot of conflict in in your life, and. Uh, um, one of the questions that I have very few prepared questions, but um, we're on the subject of conflict. And I, I was wondering, um, it's a twofold question. Like, do you feel that the conflict in your life has shaped you? And I, I, I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be yes, but I'm just saying it to, to get the story. And then, uh, and then also, would you consider yourself a person with internal conflicts now? Um, uh, conflict, I think, is one of my first languages, um, or rage, or violence, or something like that. You know, they're all just noises we make for the same thing. Um, and yeah, you can look at that in circumstances of the country, personal circumstances, um, ways within which I grew up, um, seeing all kinds of violence around me and, and experiencing it too. That. It is no surprise to me that I found myself for a particular career of my life um, studying and then working in the context of conflict. I think it was possibly a necessary thing to to work out something that was in me and to work out my relationship to conflict. Um, And that's societal as well. You know, I grew up speaking English, but also knowing Irish and wondering why on earth are we speaking a language that isn't from here? And um, that automatically leads you into a serious question of conflict, which isn't about, uh, Mm. well, it doesn't have to be about the question of war. Conflict is just going, what I want is different to what you want. I mean, I'm in conflict with myself so often, um, where you experience different desires occurring at the same time, where you can't imagine that both of them can be fulfilled, um, that somehow one is going to have to take precedence over the other. So, Mm. yeah, conflict is conflict is amoral in that sense it's the question about what you're going to do with it mm. um so yeah so there's there's fundamental personal and political con- conflicts and then being gay and being you know interested in religion and i suppose for a long period of time not now but for a long period of time i was really keen to belong to some of the formal halls of religion and um, whether that was as a priest or just as a kind of a, a recognized member of a catholic church or whatever um, all of those things contributed to being in conflict and uh, those kinds of conflicts took a long time to figure out what I wanted to do with the rage um, that came about. So um, mm. I suppose for me, poetry is a, a working out of that and language um, mm-hmm. and finding ways to, to live with that rage um, and mm. f- finding ways to go, I am angry enough about this to have to think um, carefully about what I'm going to do with that anger 
from myself mm -hmm. as well as in a public life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so and so absolutely, I, I totally feel like, I mean, I don't feel like I walk around as a, a burning, um, burning uh, in, with burning rage, but um, I do notice that there's certain things on certain days can get right under the skin and can set me off. Um, and I don't go into rages, but I do find myself going over and over again and going back over an argument or thinking, you know, um, and then there's certain things like Brexit, for example, that's happened in the last five years that uh, for me just exacerbate a profound frustration with feeling helplessness about the question of mm. Irishness, the Irish language, um, land, questions to do with imposed borders. Um, that it's very hard to know what to do about, apart from to do the only thing you know how to do. For me, it's about language, it's about public conversation, it's about writing, it's not about pretending to be neutral, it's about naming privilege where I see it or where I have it, and finding a way to say, let's have a more interesting conversation than the one that um, the Tory government across the water in London are trying to curate, which I think is um, deeply misguided mm. and fundamentally based on a premise of lie and supremacy. Mm. So that, for me, I, I'm uninterested in neutrality in the question of conflict. What I'm really interested sure. in is being um, articulate about particularity, but not in a way where I am going to um, uh, remove the possibility of safety from somebody who disagrees with me. Mm. Do you have Do you have favorite uh, prayers or poems or both that you um, that come to mind in different types of conflict? Do you have sort of some greatest greatest hits or are you just so well versed in poetry that uh um, you know different one comes to mind every time um i i don't know that it's about being so well versed in it i suppose there's certain things that come to mind at different times sometimes when you're really exacerbated a, a different a kind of, i love poem might come to mind that to read it then would totally change you other mm. times yeah it could just be different things mm. um yeah uh I mean, when I'm really angry at something enormous, like a political thing, like homophobia or or with empire or whatever, um, I I'm not sure that I turn to other poems just to echo my anger. I suppose I I'm interested in turning to poetry that will focus energy into something that can be creative. That interests me um, mm -hmm. because in the con in the context of conflict and why ultimately I wanted to move away from direct conflict resolution. Um, and focusing much more of my time on poetry, which has always been part of my life, as we were talking about, was because I I, I became I became cautious about conflict resolution as an end in and of itself, because sometimes to give conflict a lot of attention means that the conflict needs to to survive in order for it to continue to get attention. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in not in bypassing it, but in pushing through it into thinking what could creativity on the other side of conflict resolution look like. What can I create in art, in human relationships, in in changed policies, in social movements? Um, that really interests me. Um, mm -hmm. And by, I think, tapping into the question of human creativity, which everybody has, um, that became a an intervention in conflict through a different door, rather than saying, let's talk about the issues, let's map them out, let's look at the ones that are easy to address, let's find compromise on the ones we can't agree on. You know, all yeah. those techniques that are really good. Yeah. Um, I, and, and they will continue, but I suppose I found myself thinking from an intellectual point of view, as well as an, inter, an interventionist point of view, to think, what can we create out of all of this? <laughs> and that really interests me. And then the tools of dialogue become tools to use in the creation of something that's already been created, um, whether that's a poem, whether that's a piece of art, whether that's a piece of policy. Mm. Um, that really interests me, the question of creativity as an intervention into the into wow. ingrained conflict. That's great. And do you often have poems in, in moments that, that come kind of unbidden? Like, do you have to grab something and, and get it? Get it oh out. yeah, I text. I text myself. <laughs> oh, that's what you do. I have a Google document, oh, and, yeah. and I've only recently had like irrepressible poetry, which is mm. a really nice. It has such a calming feeling. Like it's like lovely. It's like it, rather mm. than. Uh, I guess it doesn't usually happen to me in times of of actual anger. It's more a transcendent experience. Mm. I had one the other just just recently, and. Uh, and it's it is such an interesting thing, but I think it's a long it was a long road for me of hearing about poetry, 
and being like, ah, uh, like, you know, I, I don't know. And, and then it just, it, it was such a long road of coming to realize that these kinds of things are so, um, are so important and that the quality of the poem isn't, uh, isn't the actual thing. It's that something came up and some words to express the inexpressible came up and, and, and you, you were able to write it down, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I love to hear your inspirations and how, how grounded in, in reality they are rather than, you know, um, pie in the sky, you know, walking in the heather, which, uh, I, it seems that you do a fair bit of that. Uh, yes. And the word word in Irish for Heather is freach, which means rage. So <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So yeah, that yeah. sounds cool. It sounds like Irish culture and Irish language has an encoded uh, sort of uh, a healthy um, view of some of these things or interesting view anyway. And, well, it's, yeah, so many languages do. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that the invitation is to look at the etymology Um if you're interested, you don't have to. Right. But the etymology of the language that you speak or some of yeah. the ones that you even speak poorly, um, that's always interesting. Yeah, you know? it stops you in yeah. your tracks. Like you said, recently someone said kindness, pointed out mm. uh, kindness is actually uh, uh, an assertion or a, an acknowledgement that we are of the same kind, that we mm. have, that we are, you know, it's not something I give to you as a gift from my greater mm. store of resources. It's... Mm it's acknowledging that we are uh, of the same kind uh, and uh, things like that. They really stop you in yeah. your tracks and it does show the power of language as much as it is a tool of oppression and, and, uh, mm. and you know, a tool of, of subversion. It, it is a tool of, uh, of expression and creation. So uh, yeah, that's, mm. that's beautiful. I love that. Um, well, okay. Um, I, I think, I think that's a natural, uh, ending place. And, um, this has been wonderful. I'm really glad we got into, I, I'm, I'm always, I always prefer when it gets personal, okay, um, good. <laughs> <laughs> because I kind of, uh, can't stand, um, feeling complicit in an interview that was just, um, an interview, you know, so that I really appreciate that you were willing and even led the way in going down the, that, that path, a conflict resolution path that was left open there. Um, and uh, uh, it's lovely to be with you, Aaron. Lovely to be with you. Is there anything you'd like people to go and, and see? Is there anything kind of recent going on with you that people can get involved in? Um, so we just came to the end of, but it's all available, the second season of Poetry Unbound. Yeah. Um, and one of the great joys of um, that program that the team of us work on with On Being is um, hearing from so many people who say, oh, that poem moved me or that poem moved me to write a poem of my own or I always wanted to have the confidence to speak about my liking of poetry, but I didn't have a great teacher in school or I did, but I didn't pay attention or it just yeah. didn't, you know. So yeah, that yeah, folks might be interested in, in, in listening to that podcast. It's, um, it's uh, short, there's 12 to 15 minutes long. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I've, I've, I've listened to it and that's what I really appreciate about it is that, uh, you, you don't have to think of it as like, Oh, I'm interested in a two hour conversation about <laughs> no, it can be like no. a little snippet. And, uh, so that's beautiful. I do hope that people do that. Um, I have an odd desire to read you the poem that I wrote. Uh, okay. And I don't know if that would be awkward. Well, w read it away. Yeah. <laughs> and we can finish off with that. Or we can finish off with, I can edit it out and realize that I'm embarrassing myself. <laughs> um, it was, uh, let's see here, I have it here. It's called uh, Open Me. Um, okay, I can't believe I'm doing this. I might have to edit this out, but I just, I don't speak to poets very often. <laughs> uh, uh, so Open Me. Um, <clears throat> Open me like a shell, split me like a stone, poured out into your presence, dissolved. Only then may I approach myself to know that I have something worth pouring out and that it is yours alone. Return, return to the low place where all water goes. Leave my husk where it lays. May it be a totem of redemption and may people see it first as beautiful until they may see it as common. And, and we die each time 
and smirk wickedly falling over the edge. It's such a, an interesting thing to wonder who you're talking to in that. There was the you in there and the open me um, and the, you know, the split me like a stone. In some ways, it feels like you could be um, speaking to different parts of yourself um, yeah, and seeing different parts of yourself. You know, the, the part that's water, the part that um, opens easily like a shell, um, the part that um, needs to be split like a stone and seeing them all. Um, as different parts of the self. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, and it's it's funny because it did come out um, quickly, and I didn't notice the distinction between the shell and the stone. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but it's so true because the shell is kind of something that people open regularly. There are tools. You for didn't that. say. Yeah, you didn't say crush me or grind me. You know, there's all these right. other things that you could have said about those things. That's so um, interesting. But you didn't. Um. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you for listening to that and for the my insight. Pleasure. Thanks for sharing it. Yep, no problem. I read a poem in my last episode. I wonder if it's going to be a, a thing now. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. <laughs> yeah, just slipping into poetry. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. And I do encourage people to go listen to the um, Poetry Unbound podcast and to to check out your poetry. And and uh, and you are uh, you are someone who is is creating a space of redemption in the world. In my in my humble opinion. And, and so I, I, I appreciate your time so much today. And, uh, and I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Aaron. You too.